thanks folks for joining in. Uh, this is the uh, keynote at the end of PyCon Faitabad day one. Thank you, Paul Gansel, for joining us. Um, let me introduce Paul first before we get started. Paul Gansel is actually a software developer at Google right now, and he's a C Python core developer. He also is a maintainer of Python Date Util and Setup Tools, and he contributes to many other open source projects. Thank you, Paul, for joining us. You can get started. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Um, right. So as VJ said, uh, I'm a software engineer at Google and a contributor to many open source projects, uh, among other things. I maintain Date Util and Setup Tools, which are, uh, have a large number of uh, downloads every day. Um, uh, and I'm also a core developer of the Python language, which is pretty much a superset of the users of, uh, of date util and setup tools, uh, where I've been focused on mostly on the date time module and uh, now the zone info module, which I'm very uh, happy to have added to Python in Python 3.9. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the uh, something I'm calling the stable interface paradox, uh, which is something that I think comes up with a lot of big popular projects like the ones that I work on. Uh, but as you'll see, it's a problem that first manifests before your library or your application or your API endpoint or whatever gets popular at all. Um, but before we get into that, I thought I'd just take a moment to appreciate the fact that I'm giving this talk. Uh, you see, this is actually my first keynote. Uh, and I hope that you won't take that the same way you would if uh, your pilot said, hey, this is actually my first flight. Or if your doctor was like, wow, I, I, I've never taken out an appendix before. That's great. Uh, but um, you know, rather, I, I hope that you'll just share in my excitement to do a great job for you all today. Um, indeed, I was thrilled and flattered when the organizers asked me to speak at the conference, and I'm really excited to share this experience with you. Um, the thing is, though, uh, I'm a little sad that this didn't involve actually uh, visiting Hyderabad. Uh, so I thought I'd actually start by recreating that experience at home. And uh, I, I hope that the organizers aren't starting to regret giving me an hour to pontificate on whatever I want at this point. But hopefully, this will be entertaining. So obviously, going to conferences isn't all fun and games. And Hyderabad is 18 hours away by plane from New York. So uh, I wouldn't want to miss out on that experience. Uh, you can't see it here, but I have a two-year-old at home. So I was able to accurately simulate the uh, experience of a screaming toddler on the plane kicking the back of your seat while you're trying to sleep. Uh, once I landed in Hyderabad, obviously the first thing I had to do was to get a biryani, since everyone keeps telling me like, oh, if you go to Hyderabad, get a biryani. They're so delicious. Uh, and I got to say, I loved it. I love that authentic biryani taste. Plus, it's so great that they only take about four minutes to cook, right? Like, uh, it, must, it, it must be so convenient. Uh, so now... Uh, I'm not much of a sports guy, but I figured the best way to fit in the, with the locals would be to watch a cricket match. Uh, you know, cricket is, is is a huge thing in India, right? Uh, unfortunately, those games are just way too long for me. Uh, so I couldn't quite make it through the whole match. Uh, but on the upside, I, I did find out that I look uh, I look super good in a in a Sunrisers jersey. So maybe maybe that's another career path for me. Um, of course, I've been told that Hyderabad is the city of nawabs and kebabs, uh, so you know food is going to feature prominently in any good conference. So I thought I'd make some of that famous Hyderabadi halim. Um, I know it's not in season right now, uh, but that's the one advantage of doing this at home, right? I can make it whenever I want. Uh, of course, uh, you know, I didn't have uh, exactly all the right ingredients or like a recipe or anything, so I had to get a little creative. But based on a Google image search, I'm pretty sure I did exactly the right thing, right? Like, it, 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 that's probably exactly what Halim tastes like. Uh, OK, but in all seriousness, I, I appreciate you bearing with me as I try and come to terms with the fact that I don't get to be there in person with y'all and uh, and uh, experience your culture and your city for real. Uh, obviously, oatmeal and food coloring is not a real substitute for authentic Halim. And despite the 18-hour plane ride, I do fully intend to get out there one day uh, and see it in person. Um, but now that we've hopefully exercised some of our frustrations with the current pandemic environment, I think we're ready to get on with the business of talking about, you know, like programming and stuff. All right, so the serious business that I'd like to talk to you about today is something I'm calling the stable interface paradox. And it's a phenomenon that I've observed in my open source work, uh, but I think the phenomenon applies more widely than that. And the paradox is that the smaller your user base, the harder it is to design an appropriate interface. But the larger your user base, the harder it is to change the interface that you've already, uh, that you've already put out there. Um, and what this means is that 
you're almost always best able to implement your decisions about your interface before you have sufficient information to make those decisions in the first place. It means that a lot of interface design ends up as educated guesswork. It also means that you'll almost always make some wrong decisions and those will be very hard to change in the future. Um, and I think there are two main phenomena that drive the stable interface paradox. The first is that users want stable interfaces. Uh, I'm sure this is intuitive to most all of us because uh, no matter whether you're a maintainer or not, you're definitely a user of interfaces. We all use dozens of interface interfaces every day. And you know it would be supremely annoying uh, to wake up one day and, for example, find out that you can't buy keyboards in your preferred layout anymore, right? We've deprecated QWERTY keyboards, so now you can only get Devorah keyboards. Uh, that would be super annoying. Um, similarly, if someone was offering me an API endpoint, but they said, we're just going to randomly change this interface once a month, at least once a month, we're going to change the interface. Uh, you know, there would have to be something extremely valuable on the other side of that interface for me to try and build a business around it or any sort of stable thing, because the maintenance costs would be enormous. I would have to be constantly changing my client just to be able to reach this API. Uh, and even smaller changes can be problematic, right? Because as I mentioned, we're all surrounded by interfaces. We don't just use one of them, we use dozens of them. Uh, and those small changes can add up quickly. So if you imagine you're using, say, 200 interfaces per day, and I, I just pulled that number out of nowhere, uh, it, it could be much higher or much lower. Uh, but if each one of those broke something just once every three years, uh, that would mean that you would have some interface that you use breaking at least once a week, right? That that translates into something that's even worse than that horrible example of the API that breaks every single month. Um, so we can understand why users want stable interfaces. Um, the other side of this tension is possibly the less intuitive one. And that's that you usually don't have enough information to design your interface until you have a lot of users. And the reason for this is that almost you know, almost all products do, or at least should, measure their success in user satisfaction. Uh, whether it's an open source library or paid software, you, you should be wanting to provide a useful and enjoyable experience. Uh, and the best way to find out if you're providing something useful is to observe, listen to, and learn from the people who are actually using it. And the thing is, this is not something you can solve with a few focus groups. Uh, I, I would actually argue that you need a fairly large user base uh, before you can truly understand how well you've designed your interface. Some of you are probably familiar with this saying that's popular in the open source community, uh, which is that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Uh, from what I can tell, this is primarily used to mean that uh, when you have a large community reviewing patches, uh, looking at your source code, um, you know, testing things in advance, uh, that someone is bound to notice when something goes wrong and you'll be able to fix it before it hits prod and before it hits your users. But I think there's another reasonable way to in interpret this. And it's one that resonates deeply with my experience, which is that when you have a large number of users and they're deploying your application or your library or whatever, they'll eventually just hit all of your bugs, uh, even the most obscure ones. And with another few orders of magnitude, uh, more users, they might even report those edge cases back to you in some useful format. Um, I was recently reminded of an excellent example of this that came up on the Setup Tools project this year. Uh, now, Setup Tools is over 15 years old. It has about, you know, it's downloaded something like 2 million times every single day. Uh, and back in May, someone reported a very strange bug that, as far as I know, uh, no, uh, has been in, in Setup Tools for a very long time, and no one has ever hit it, or at least they've never hit it and then figured out what it was and reported it back to us. Um, and to summarize the issue, the user showed up uh, and they said that an executable they were building, um, uh, in that executable, package resources would fail on his workstation and only on his workstation. It, it would even work if someone logged into another user account on the same machine. Uh, and it turns out that this is just a razor thin edge case, uh, which depended on a bunch of strange conditions, one of which was his actual last name. The user's name mat mattered here. You see, the user's name uh, was uh, A. Eggenberger. Uh, so his username was A. Eggenberger. I'm not sure which of these two things was relevant, uh, but you know they're obviously related uh, and you don't really need to dig too much deeper into it because the consequence of this is that Windows would mangle this username into this, this weird, thing, which is a nine four four seven tilde one dot egg. Um, and, and this was to uh, to have compatibility with something called the 8.3 convention, which is that on like very old systems, DOS would only allow you to have a, a fixed size, uh, a fixed size 
file name. And so uh, th there was this convention where you could shorten things up to have eight characters plus uh, three file extensions. And then you would use this tilde to indicate which of the multiple uh, things that are, have colliding namespaces it would be. Um, so when this ran into uh, this ran into a problem when package resources found this folder and decided that because it ends in .egg, uh, that this folder was an egg, which is an obsolete uh, Python packaging format. And then it would try and validate the folder and say, uh, "Oh, th this is supposed to be an egg folder, so it should have all these. Uh, it should have all these uh, uh, very properties." Uh, and then when it didn't have those properties because it's not a, a Python egg, uh, package resources would fail. Um, so the thing is, this is a fairly obscure edge case, um, but. What's unusual about this is not that it happened. What's unusual about this is that we heard about it at all, right? You have to have a very long tail of users to hit exactly the right combination of uh, of circumstances to hit a bug like this. And probably in anything that you're designing right now, you're, uh, you, you have bugs like this lurking around, just waiting to frustrate people to no end, many of whom will not be able to debug them. Um, so this is a, a real benefit of having a lot of users, right? Is that you, you really smooth off all these little rough edges, even the most obscure ones. Uh, another example of a fairly obscure bug is issue number 1875 on the CPython bug tracker. And this was first reported way back in 2008 um, by Armin Rigo, who's a developer of, of the PyPy, uh, interpreter, which is an alternate implementation of Python. Um, and you know, this is a fairly obscure issue. Uh, e even, even though, uh, even though it, it is, is not super consequential, it was independently discovered a, a few times over the years, in, in, including by my myself. I independently discovered it in 20, uh, 2019. And I didn't even comment on the issue at the time. Uh, so that goes to show you that the people who show up on your bug tracker are actually probably a small fraction of the people who are actually hitting this bug and even tracking it down. Um, but th you know, this was a fairly benign one, uh, which is why it took so long to get fixed. Uh, the problem was that if you put certain types of syntax error in certain dead code branches of a program, uh, they wouldn't get detected. So for example, it is a syntax error to have a break statement outside of a loop. Uh, this shouldn't even compile. Uh, you shouldn't even be able to, even, even if that F function is never called, uh, you shouldn't be, th this should be a syntax error just when you define it. Um, and the reason that it was even possible to to uh, get past that and not raise a syntax error was that well, th so the issue was if you have this if zero right uh, and a code literal uh, it, it, anything in here that has this specific form of syntax error would be allowed uh, and the reason this was possible was because at least at the time Python had an LL1 grammar so it had very limited context about where each token lived in a in a python program and so what this means is that the grammar couldn't possibly it couldn't properly encode the fact that it is syntactically invalid to have a break outside of a loop and the way python got around this because it was uh, it, it did have rules about syntactic validity of things that uh, were not encodable in the l1 grammar um, is the the uh, is that it would do the checking for syntactic validity in two stages. First, it would parse the whole thing and emit bytecode using just the grammar. And then the compiler would go over the bytecode that was produced and look for syntactically invalid stuff, breaks outside of loops, returns outside of functions, that sort of thing. And, um, and but the other thing is that what the compiler also does is it does a, a, a fairly minor optimization step. So the compiler would notice that this is an if zero, uh, and that that means you're never even going to see it. So anything after that, anything in that conditional, it would just not emit any bytecode for. It wouldn't emit any bytecode for anything there at all. Um, and what that means is that in that second step, when you're checking the bytecode for syntactic validity, the the compiler didn't have anything to work with, and so it would say, "All right, this this is fine, right? There, there's no bytecode here that could go wrong." Um, so. Uh, why am I telling you about this obscure bug that was fixed in Python 3.8 uh, and is a limitation of the grammar that uh, no longer even exists? Uh, well, this is an example of a bug that only shows up once you've built an ecosystem. It's something that you wouldn't even notice unless you were starting to do something like re-implementing Python from scratch, uh, which is not something that would happen until you have a large enough user base that people are saying, this Python thing is something real. Uh, it also would come up if you're 
you know, trying to build linters or uh, code formatters or things like that, right? People who are re-implementing the syntax of your library, they're going to start writing unit tests. They're going to start finding these edge cases. Uh, and this one is fairly benign, right? It's it's it, the problem is that it doesn't raise an error. That's not a huge deal. Um, but there are other things that you wouldn't notice, right? That would make it hard to build this ecosystem that you won't find out about until someone starts to build an ecosystem on top of it. Um, uh, the last example bug I want to show you is also from CPython. Um, and the problem here was that uh, with the from timestamp constructor, if you called it on a subclass of daytime, right? So you subclass daytime, it was inconsistent as to whether the alternate constructor would construct the base, uh, the base class, which is daytime, or the subclass. Um, basically, if you didn't give it a time zone, it would always give you your subclass. But if you did give it a time zone, it would give you uh, the base class, the daytime.daytime. Um, and this was just happening because of an implementation detail where uh, converting something to a specific time zone involved daytime arithmetic. And daytime arithmetic would always return the base class. It would always return a daytime, no matter what subclass was added to it. Um, but the thing is, uh, you know, this seems like an obvious bug, but the thing is the root of this bug turned out to be a deliberate design decision. You see, in the standard library, most classes and built-ins that offer alternate constructors, uh, such as arithmetic or, you know, from timestamp or something, they'll always return an, an example, an instance of the base class, not the derived class, um, which means that uh, most people would consider that the bug was that this thing is not respecting my subclass, but from the point of view of the standard library, it may be that the behavior where it actually does return your subclass is the bug. Um, one of the reasons for this is that subclasses are allowed to change, or you know, the 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 idea was that subclasses should be allowed to change their constructor, right? So you should be able to create a daytime subclass that doesn't take, uh, you know, year, month, day, such and such, right? It could just take strings, or it could always just return now, uh, which means that the base class. Um, doesn't know how to construct an instance of your subclass. It can't just say, look at the type and then call it as if you're calling the base class. Um, so the recommendation was that if you want alternate constructors to return an instance of your subclass, you should explicitly override them. Um, but what I find found, at least in the case of daytime, is that people find it like super annoying to re-implement the base class's entire interface just to make sure that their subclass's type is persistent, right? And in fact, they don't actually seem to care that much when you uh, add a requirement that the the subclass constructor has to be uh, callable using the arguments passed to the base class. Um, so you know this is just one particularly unusual manifestation of the wider problem that people were consistently reporting or working around. Right? There were issues where they're like, "Wow, ah, why do I have to reimplement this whole thing?" Right? It seems like a huge pain in the ass. Um, but the thing is, I don't want this to say like, "Oh yeah, they they really messed up with daytime." <laughs> what idiots! Uh, the people who designed Python and this system in general are, are extremely careful thinkers who I respect immensely, right? They have exquisite design sensibilities. They got an enormous amount of this language right. But I would say that they just didn't predict that this would be a usability concern for their users, right? And, uh, you know, until we got feedback from these long tail users who are trying to subclass daytime and, you know, starting to add nanoseconds and things that only became relevant long after the daytime module uh, was constructed, uh, that we found out that this is uh, that we've designed something that doesn't quite work. Um, this should be a very humbling lesson. It's a very humbling lesson for me, right? Because I, I don't even aspire to uh, be as good at designing interfaces as as Guido, right? To to create something as as uh, that's stood the test of time nearly as well as Python has. Uh, but you know, I do aspire to build interfaces that are uh, that will. Uh, be usable by a large number of people. Uh, which brings me to my next point, which is that we actually sort of know this, right? This is, shouldn't necessarily be so shocking that I would be humble enough to think that people make mistakes. Uh, it's often been said that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. And the same goes for code that we release to our users. Interestingly, apparently it also goes for pithy sayings, because although I've attributed this to Helmut von Moltke. Uh, this is actually a paraphrasing. The original quote was in German, but from what I can tell, a much closer translation is, no plan of operations extends with any certainty beyond the first contact with the main hostile force. Uh, evidently, as soon as the enemy got a hold of this particular phrasing, they just chopped it up and used it for parts. And actually, I think we're sort of better off for that because I don't 
I certainly don't want to have to say this mouthful every single time uh, I want to evoke this concept. Uh, and the same thing will happen to the programs you write when they hit your users. It's even spawned a whole genre of memes. Uh, the idea behind these kinds of memes is that no matter how well you design your program, your users will do horrible things to it. They'll drill holes in it and use it as a bong and then uh, call your tech support and ask you why it doesn't have better airflow. They'll use it in the least efficient possible way, like, like these cats. Um, or like this guy, they'll seem to do everything except use your, your product as intended. Um, uh, the thing is, I, I sometimes think that the undercurrent of this is, look how stupid our users are, right? Uh, like This guy's licking the bottom of a glass. What, what kind of an idiot would use my product like that? But I actually prefer to see them as saying something different, which is that we should be humble about our ability to understand and predict our users' needs, because they'll often surprise us. In fact, we can take lessons from our users using it wrong. Um, I'm sure many of you seen, have seen something like this before, right? It's called a desire path. Um, someone would build this perfectly good sidewalk, and everyone sees, oh, you know, I, I, I'm going to have to walk uh, an extra like five meters to get from here to here. But if I just walk on the grass, I can get there much faster. Uh, and so they do that enough, and they wear down the grass until there's this new path that is you know, obviously not as good as a sidewalk, but it gets there faster. Um, uh, and the thing is, this isn't people being stupid and not realizing that there's a sidewalk there that you're supposed to walk on. Uh, it's actually people being smart and efficient in achieving their goals, which may be different than the goals of the people who designed the sidewalk. Um, so ideally, you would keep out for indications that a desire path is developing and then try and lean into it, right? You say, People are going to create a new path here anyway. I may as well pave it. Or if, for example, this uh, in your metaphor, the the grass is the only uh, the only place where the scaly-backed hornswoggle or some other endangered animal can lay its uh, its eggs, and people walking there is going to disrupt an entire ecosystem. You should put up a fence, put up some guardrails to indicate to people, hey, it's actually important that you use this this cement sidewalk because. Uh, this is something, uh, there was a very good reason for me to put the sidewalk that where I did. Uh, one last benefit that I'd like to highlight about having a large user base is that as the size of your user base gets bigger, you start seeing problems that you may never have thought to test for because they're not something you would experience in your daily life. Uh, but they are the reality for many, many people. For example, apparently, um, if you set your WhatsApp interface to use a language that is written from right to left, so it, 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 it'll have some RTL marker, is what it's called, right to left marker. That's like Arabic, Hebrew, something like that. Um, when you play a voice message, uh, you get this weird behavior, or at least you did at the time that this GIF was made, um, uh, where the the progress indicator seems to go in two directions. It goes from the left to the right and the right to the left. Because evidently, whoever implemented this interface implemented one of these as something that's sensitive to the RTL marker and the other one that's not. Um, and you know, maybe you thought to test for this. And uh, you know, obviously, this kind of thing is, um, is a, a lot more important for me to say to engineers in California who are shocked, just shocked that anyone would live outside of Pacific time zone. And they're like, tell me about this fabled land called not California. Um, but maybe you haven't thought uh, to test that your thing works with like a screen reader or that your interface is colorblind friendly. Uh, you know, the world is a wide and varied place. And if you pay attention to your users as your user base grows, uh, you may find that they're telling you about some interesting way of being human that you may have overlooked. Um, and it will help you design that better. Um, so, so far, I've only really covered the benefits of having a large and thriving ecosystem. Your code gets battle tested and hopefully incrementally improved as your users go out there and test everything for you and find all your bugs. And they can help design, uh, uh, guide your design decisions. Um, but now it's time to get into the less rosy side of having a large user base. Um, this here is Hiram's law, which is something I bring up very frequently in design discussions. And as an aside, I, I just recently learned that it was formulated by one of my colleagues at Google, which is one benefit of uh, working at a very large company that uh, hires a lot of, uh, of, of high quality technical talent. And as an aside, they have an office in Hyderabad. Um, so uh, Hiram's law states that, uh, uh, that when the number of users of your API gets large enough, someone will depend on every observable behavior of the system, uh, whether it's in the contract or not. Uh, what this basically means is that frequently your bugs end up as you know, what they sometimes call load-bearing bugs. Uh, and people will start 
depending on behaviors that if you were designing the system from scratch, you would be like, this is definitely a bug. I shouldn't put it this way. Uh, for example, Joel Spolsky has a blog post called My First Build You Review, where he explains that there's a peculiarity in the way Excel and Visual Basic handle daytime uh, date times. Uh, it, they both store a, a date time or a date as an integer offset from some epoch. Excel uses uh, January 1st, 1900 as their epoch, and Visual Basic, oddly, uses December 31st, 1899. But if you figure out what they're uh, what what these uh integers are for modern dates you'll find that they are actually the same um like if you look at it for december 5th 2020 you'll find that visual basic and excel store it as the same integer um and it turns out the reason for this is that excel has a bug where it considers 1900 to be a leap year but 1900 wasn't a leap year um and what's interesting about this is not the fact that this bug exists uh it's not it, it uh it, it turns out that, that Microsoft knew about this bug uh, and has known about it, and they haven't fixed it. In fact, not only did they not fix it, they introduced it intentionally. <laughs> you see, the reason that Excel does this is because they originally wanted to be compatible with Lotus 123 spreadsheets, and Lotus 123 spreadsheets had this bug. Uh, and there's even speculation that Lotus 123 also introduced it deliberately because they were designing in a different environment that was very memory constrained and they could save a few bytes by not dealing with the fact that 1900 is a leap year. Um, so this is the flip side of a large number of users, right? Backwards compatibility concerns tend to dramatically curtail the available options you have for changing your interface. Um, for example, let's go back to one of the obscure bugs we saw earlier. If you recall, we had that bug in CPython where optimizing out certain dead code branches um, would fail to catch certain in syntax errors. And originally, the way we fixed this was by changing the optimization so that the compiler would just emit bytecode for all the dead code. It would start with a jump that says, skip all the bytecode we're about to see, and then it would emit the rest of the bytecode. So there should be no real performance problems with that. And um, you just have, uh, and the bytecode is an implementation detail of the interpreter anyway. So who could possibly notice this? Uh, but of course, someone did notice it. In fact, this was reported before CPython 3.8 even came out uh, and got to the, the final stages. It, it was reported in the beta phase. Um, you see, it turns out that coverage.py uses the emitted bytecode to determine which lines are covered and not covered by your test. And what that means is that if there's no bytecode corresponding to a given line, coverage.py will consider that line covered. Like they, they, you know, they'll treat it as like a doc string or something else like that. Um, so when this change went in, where now the bytecode more accurately reflects the the uh, the the code that generated it, uh, people started complaining because they had these dead code branches that previously were being reported as covered, but now are all of a sudden being reported as uncovered. And they got mad because their metrics went down. They were like, hey, I used to have 100% code coverage, and then I updated Python 3.8. I didn't change anything. And now my code coverage metrics went down. And uh, I guess they didn't want to have to add pragma no cover to all their dead code branches. So it turns out that people were uh, evidently found it to be a critical feature that this obscure bug based on an implementation detail of the way CPython chooses to optimize its code at compilation time, um, you know, uh, apparently that was a critical feature. You know, as Hiram's Law states, every observable feature will be depended on by somebody eventually. All right, so this is a fairly trivial example, right? It, it didn't really hurt anything and it was fairly easy to fix it. And the whole problem got obviated at the end of the day by, um, switching to a grammar that could actually encode these sorts of syntax errors. Uh, but to see the kinds of problems that this can cause for a whole ecosystem, we should now take a journey into the world of packaging and back 20 years in time to the beginning of the notion of creating a Python package at all. Uh, so prior to Python 2.0, uh, the land of Python packaging was, uh, to put it mildly, bleak. Um, there was no PyPI, no pip install, no setup tools, and Prior to Python 2.0, there wasn't even a disk details. Uh, this is one reason why Python's batteries included philosophy was seen as such a strength, because I think that the packaging in environment in other languages was similarly bleak. And the difference was that in Python, they just took all the useful third party stuff and made it part of core Python. So it was just available. Um, but that's not really a sustainable way to maintain uh, a language. And so it, at some point, we had to have a better story for how third-party code could be packaged and installed. Um, 
And so Python 2.0 introduced distutils, which um, was uh, supposed to be uh, something that distro maintainers would use. Uh, and it would give them a sort of standard way of taking a Python package and converting it into um, a Linux distro package. And then it would also provide sysadmins a standard way of taking a, a system, uh, a Python package and installing it onto the target system. Um, so package author authors would write the setup.py file uh, and it would run distutils.core.setup. And then the end users would get this uh, CLI that let them do setup.py install, setup.py test, that sort of thing. Um, and to solve the problem of distributing these packages, uh, they created PyPI, which was actually just an index for the metadata. So distro sales would generate the metadata, you'd upload it there, and it would have a link to your website where you could download the package. Um, and the way you installed these things was still uh, pretty uh, much a pain in the ass because you have to, um, you would have to look at the metadata yourself, figure out what all its dependencies were, and then go back to PyPI, download them all yourself, repeat the whole process, and install everything in the right order. Uh, so obviously that's <laughs> that, that's an improvement, but it's not a significant usability improvement. Um, and in 2004, uh, Philip Ebby re released a solution to this as part of Setup Tools. And Setup Tools was basically extensions to distutils that brought in a huge number of features for building and installing and managing your packages. And I think this was useful, right? Because you just install Setup Tools all you have to do is install setup tools. And then that sort of bootstraps the whole packaging environment for you. You get easy install, uh, which worked a lot like pip. Um, and that would go to PyPI and do everything for you. Um, and if you're using setup tools, that that whole thing is also built directly into setup.py install. So they could look at your dependencies and then hit easy install and download your dependencies for you. Um, and as you can imagine, this was a very popular extension, and it still is, uh, to the point where people started assuming that it was installed, even without declaring any sort of dependency on it, right? Python just sort of started including setup tools as, uh, as, as standard, e even though uh, it wasn't really in the standard library. And then in 2008, um, pip was introduced, uh, which was kind of spun off the, the feature of, of easy install. It was, a, it was easier to use and it was a lot more user friendly. And that also became uh, quite popular as well. So at this point, Python packaging story is starting to look like something that you might recognize, right? The, the packaging landscape was looking better than ever. You have pip now, you have setup tools, you have PyPI, you have easy install and distutils and a number of other innovations that I haven't mentioned uh, here, uh, that I haven't mentioned here. But um, as you can see from this stock photo that I've included, uh, the dark clouds were gathering on the horizon. Uh, the problem is that most things here were being done in an ad hoc fashion. People were building on top of each other's work, uh, but there was no clearly specified interface. The interface you were targeting was whatever works with whatever people are already doing, because otherwise you, you're, you're not getting injected into this, um, into the, you're not in getting uh, any traction in the ecosystem. Um, and it leaves a lot less room for innovation when you have to be, for example, bug com for bug compatible with setup tools, right? You have to build exactly setup tools and you can only extend it. Um, and things got even more complicated, right? Because in order to, in order to have this sort of, uh, in order to have this sort of compatibility, people had to do these weird things. Um, for example, uh, distribute. At some point, setup tools became sort of unmaintained or lightly maintained, and there were a lot of community patches building up. Um, and so someone forked setup tools and created this thing called distribute. Um, and distribute was uh, was actually something that you imported by importing setup tools. So you would install distribute, and then uh, and then all the packages that work with uh, import setup tools would just work, but they would have more bugs fixed. Um, and then uh, Setup Tools itself did a version of this because to this day, if you do import Setup Tools, it will monkey patch distutils. So if you have a, a setup.py file that only uses distutils, but it also imports Setup Tools, uh, you may actually be relying on features and bug fixes that are in Setup Tools, even though you're not using those features from Setup Tools. Um, and then pip jumped on the bandwagon as well, which is that whenever they were invoking setup.py commands, they would inject import setup tools into your setup.py to make it so that more packages would just work, um, which means that a lot of people were using setup tools and not even realizing it. They, they thought they were using distutils. Um, so this is a very tangled web of, of interconnectedness and it, none, none of these interfaces are specified and it's very hard to untangle this. And it created a lot of churn because Again, users like their stable interfaces. So when changes 
when we tried to upstream changes to disk utils, uh, the few people who weren't using a code path that was hitting setup tools were finding that it was breaking their stuff. So disk utils ended up getting frozen. And then um, they created this thing called disk, disk utils 2, which itself turned out to be a pain. And so that got abandoned and deprecated. Um, and now disk utils itself is deprecated just in favor of setup tools. You say, all right, disk utils will always be there for the compatibility stuff. Well, not always, but uh, for a long time, disk utils has been and will continue to be there um, for compatibility, but you should always be using setup tools. Setup tools itself is maintained, but as we heard earlier, setup tools had a, an enormous number of features. It was all packaged together, right? Easy install, package resources, all these setup, obscure setup.py commands. And so since I've been involved in the setup, in the setup tools project, uh, a large part of what I've been working on is actually deprecating and removing those features because setup tools is this big monolith and it doesn't have enough maintainers to maintain all these features. And a lot of them today would work much better as plugins or extensions or something else like that. Um, but it's very hard to, uh, to uh, untangle that with all the backwards compatibility problems that we have. Uh, and PIP is maintained, but they're also going through a version of this, right? PIP is the right thing to do, but that is because they are doing the hard work of sort of untangling things and moving towards specified interfaces. Uh, and a lot of the work in moving towards specified interfaces is being done in the PEP 517, 518 space. Uh, there's actually a lot of, of, of PEPs that describe interfaces for packaging and interoperability standards because we realized that this issue of everyone targeting just whatever's out there is not sustainable. And we really need to specify the interfaces and make sure that the interfaces are the really the only reliable uh, parts of uh, uh, behaviors of the system. Um, so that's why PEP 518 was introduced. Uh, PEP 518 adds, PyProject.toml, uh, it, it, ma it makes it possible for you to specify requirements so that you can say, I depend on setup tools or I depend on something else, something that's not setup tools. It, it, uh, and then PEP 517 allows you to tell PIP or any other build front end, hey, um, I'm not using setup tools. I'm using Flit or Poetry or one of the other competitors that have come out now that Pi PEP uh, 517 is available. and it's feasible for people to build another backend that doesn't have a setup.py file um, that that looks at builds in a completely different way. Um, because now you can just pip install something, whether it's a wheel or a tarball, and pip will know what to do as long as you have your pyproject.toml file and it tells you which backend to use. So, um, but this, if you look at the, the dates on this, um, you can see they're from 2015 and 2016. and only recently was PEP 517 switched from provisional to final. And it's it's actually not like we um, we didn't change it at all after it was introduced. It, there were changes later and changes that only came about when we tried to release PEP 517 and make it more the default. And people were like, oh, this is um this is breaking all our stuff. You know, they they didn't they weren't sending kind notes on calligraphy um, that were written on uh, embroidered stationary, right? They they were showing up angry because we were breaking something that seems to just work. Uh, and um, and so, you know, you can see that these PyPA packages are partially so valuable because of the huge ecosystem they exist in. People can just look at them and say, oh, this just works and this is the right way to do it. Um, but the large number of users we have is also the greatest um, liability, right? Because it builds an enormous amount of inertia into the system. And it makes it difficult to make any changes without creating a lot of extra work for people and creating confusion about best practices and everything like that. Um, which brings us back to the nominal subject of the talk, right? The smaller your user base, the harder it is to know what your interface should look like. But the larger your user base, the harder it is to change your interface, to make it look like that. It's a catch-22. You can't know what your final product should look like before you get it in front of your customers. But once you've got it in front of them, you can't change it. Um, and of course, what kind of a keynote speaker would I be without producing at least one graph that looks like this, right? U using what I like to call thought leader axes, sometimes called CEO axes or Apple plots. You know, the ones that they don't have any numbers. There's no label on the Y axis, no numbers on the X axis. And they're plotting some vague concept like feedback and ability to change. But, you know, 
all joking aside, I, I do think it's useful to see this principle illustrated because even if the shapes of these curves aren't right and they're not really quantifiable concepts, I think the general trend is right. You, your understanding of the problem domain will increase as you get more and more feedback from your users about how your product is used in a diver diverse array of circumstances. But your ability to react to that feedback is inversely correlated with the number of users. Uh, and it's not clear to me looking at this that there's an optimal spot on this curve where you can be most responsive. Because you know, at the beginning, you don't have enough information to design to to uh, to make changes. But at the end, you can't. You uh, your uh, your interface has ossified enough that you can't make those changes. And even in the middle, right? I, I think that your your interface really ossifies quite quickly. And so even here, you know, you've lost eighty or ninety percent of your of your ability to change, and your um and your trajectory is fairly is fairly set. You can only kind of tweak around the edges. So. You know, I've given you some problems and maybe some advice about listening to your users, but I've tempered that advice with the dispiriting notion that even if you listen to your users, you can't necessarily react to their feedback in any way. Uh, so what do I think you should do? Well, I've got my eye on this bunker where maybe we could all hide out and wait for the inevitable downfall of civilization, uh, you know, when the mad fever dream that was the general purpose computer finally comes to an end. But no, more seriously, I, I don't think that this is an apocalyptic vision. In fact, I, I don't even think it's particularly new, right? Um, backwards compatibility and technical debt have existed since long before computers existed. There are thousands or millions of miles of railroads that are laid with specific gauges and people who are designing new trains with new technologies, they have to deal with that fact that the roads that they're gonna go on have a specific gauge and that constrains their ability to design it. And at some point, a network of roads that was originally designed for horses and carriages had to be retrofitted to accommodate cars and trucks and and, uh, and wide scale shipping. Um, you know, I don't think I have any one answer for you for how to solve this, but I can give you a few heuristics that I imagine most maintainers of large projects have internalized at least to some degree. And one of those is to design for change, right? Uh, we're, we're looking at this and we're saying, I know that I'm going to make mistakes. You know, we, we've, we've learned the lesson of humility uh, from, you know, that daytime example. Uh, and so you say, how, when are, you just, I'm not saying that you can necessarily do a perfect job of saying, of making sure that things can change, but when you first design something, just make it a step in your design process to say, how easy is this gonna be to change if we get it wrong? Um, Another thing is to avoid tight coupling. The problem we saw in the PyPA examples is that everything was very tightly coupled to each other and it was very hard to delineate uh, which things needed changing and which features people were actually going to be relying on. Um, and also hard to find the users of specific interfaces because everything was all tied up tightly. So if you can, uh, if you can avoid tight coupling, if you can sort of make smaller modules and uh, give them cleanly defined interfaces, that will help. Of course, you know, this is the monolith versus microservices uh, approach. And so it's not really an, a question of one or the other. There, there are upsides to having, uh, to having monoliths and tightly coupled interfaces. And there are, um, just like there are upsides to having clean interfaces. So you need to strike the right balance. Um, you, the license from Hi Hiram's law should be to minimize your actual public interface, which is the, the uh, Keep in mind, if there are features of your system that you don't want your users to rely upon, try and make sure that they're not observable. Uh, for example, distutails has a whole bunch of stuff in it that has nothing to do with builds, right? It has some uh, some submodule for spawning processes. It has functions for converting strings into booleans. Um, these things were never intended to be part of distutails. They just were there. They were never documented, but they were also not in like underscore modules. So people saw them and were like, oh, I should be able to use these things. And then they started relying on them. And so if we start to pull out distutails, um, people will say, hey, I, I need distutails. I need distutails for, um, uh, for spawning processes or something. And then we'll say like, what? what? You're not supposed to be using that at all. So, you know, I think that could have been avoided if, those modules were in a underscore utils, or there are actually other tricks that uh, you know some uh, open source maintainers will use that will make it even harder uh, to access these things that are not supposed to be part of the public interface. And um, you know you still can because Python is just not very good at enforcing strictness in interfaces. But um, you know 
your users will at least not accidentally uh, use these things. Uh, and then another thing is to just be decisive. I think the lesson of that curve, which is that um, you know, as your feedback is going up, your um, your ability to change is going down. It it means that you're probably never going to be any better at uh, at making the changes, right? You're, once you get the interface, once you get the information that something is going wrong, try and make the change before too many people are relying on on whatever it is that you need to change. So, at the end of the day, though, I think that the real lesson to be taken from the stable interface paradox is that um, is that you know keeping a stable interface and responding to user feedback are just intention, right? It, the, the, these are uh, two uh, two things that are both correlated to the same function, and uh, one is good and one is bad. Um, these heuristics will help, but you will get into an uncomfortable position at some point where you must balance stability against responding to user feedback, right? And it, it's hard to prioritize your next million users against your first million users, right? Because your first million users were there for you at the beginning, and you don't really want to break them. Um, but what's important is learning to strike a balance, weighing the options and weighing the trade-offs. Something that I think is uh, a useful framework for looking at trade work, uh, trade-offs uh, is a budget, right? Because you, I think you know intuitively that uh, that budgeting and the way you spend money is a sort of um, mechanism for uh, for resolving trade-offs in your own life, right? Um, so you can imagine. If you apply this to um, to your interfaces, you you imagine that uh, instead of money, you have goodwill, and you have to spend it on making breaking changes, right? So you would do the same analysis that you would do as if you were looking at your household budget uh, and you know deciding how to spend the money on the things that you want and need. So you know maybe you'll look at it and you'll say, how important is this change to me relative to the amount of goodwill that I have to spend, right? If I'm buying a car. Uh, and the options are some flashy sports car versus a sedan. Maybe you say, well, I would really love that flashy sports car, uh, but the flashy sports car costs 10 times as much and the ability to go uh, 200 miles an hour and to have scissor doors to go or gull wing doors, um, you know, is really not as important enough to me to spend an extra $100,000 on it. Um, similarly, you know, you have to make sure that you say, I don't want to break everyone just for some minor typo or a little wart, you know, that people will work around. Um, you can also think of it as uh, that you're trying to pay some compensation to your users, right? Uh, you're, and you're paying it out in goodwill. Uh, so you want to think about it in terms of how many people will it affect. Uh, you can imagine a class action settlement that, you know, if it's if you have to pay out and make restitution for a thousand people versus hundred million people. Those are very different. Um, those are very different uh, uh, prospects, uh, and so you you want to say, you know, maybe you can make some of these breaking changes if the the blast radius is small. But for the ones that really everyone is relying on, you're just kind of stuck with it. And then also, once you know, you know, how how uh, how many people it's going to affect, uh, you also have to take into account how painful it will be for the affected users. So if, if you have some bug that uh, you would like to fix that will um, you know make things easier for 99.9% .9 of users, but for that 0.1% of users, it's going to make their computer explode and set their house on fire. Uh, you, you probably don't want to fix that bug in that particular way, right? Maybe you could try and track them down and 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 fix it, but you're certainly going to want to spend a lot more effort on fixing these major bugs that are really going to break things in prod than um, than to focus on uh, on things that uh, you know that 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 are um, or than to allow someone's house to burn down or or some very very painful things even for a small number of users. And then the last thing is, you know, just keep in mind the level of goodwill that you have. If you haven't broken anything in five or six years, and you've always been very clear about backwards compatibility and showing to your users that you go above and beyond to not break their code, when you say, "Look, I really have to break your code now. I'm so sorry," uh, they're going to respect that. You know, you've built up a lot of goodwill, and you're just spending a little bit of it. If you're breaking your code every six months or something, you know, you're 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 basically just living paycheck to paycheck, right? People are giving you just a little bit of goodwill and you immediately spend it. So um, that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, 
usually at the end of the talk, I like to reflect a little bit about the lessons we've learned. Um, I think the biggest lesson I learned when putting this talk together uh, and when trying to take my thoughts and put them into words and make them into meaningful concepts was the importance of humility. Humility before your users, trying to explain that they have uh, you know, a valid perspective and trying to understand that they have a valid perspective. And then humility about the limits about your ability to design things. You know, When you're looking at the task of designing something that is going to work for 100,000 or a million or 10 million people, uh, something that may need to run on desktop computers and also supercomputers and microcontrollers and on every continent on earth and possibly even in space, uh, I think the right reaction is to view that with a sense of awe. Uh, you know, this is not an easy task, uh, and no one could possibly get it right from the start. Even the greatest successes out there are littered with failures, and you know, both small and large. Still, you know, I'd like to temper this humility with hope because people have been plagued by this problem for as long as there have been interfaces, and you know, we sometimes how we make do. We do. Um, your users will you know, maybe they'll move on or maybe they'll adjust. Uh, they might not be happy, but, you know, life goes on and we'll all just try and be respectful to one another and give you and try and give each other, uh, uh, make each other's lives a little bit better. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, uh, now I'm sure you want to know what's up with the picture of the monkey, right? You're probably racking your brain. Like, is this a metaphor for something? Does the monkey represent humility or like an earlier version of humanity or something like that. Maybe his thoughtful gaze is like him just reflecting on things. No, it's just a trick. He's just such a tricky monkey. Look at him. Look how cute he is. He, he's, he's so happy that he tricked you into, into, into trying to think about a metaphor. Ah, that sly little devil. All right. Uh, that, that, that's my time. Um, I, I'm, I'm really happy to answer any questions you might have, um, both in the virtual conference hall uh, and in, uh, you know, on other venues. I'm, I'm on social media. Um, and uh, uh, But before I do any of that, I would really like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and I'd like to thank you all for coming to watch my keynote, because this has been a real great experience for me, and I really enjoyed it. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul. Uh, that was really, really, <laughs> really good. Um, so I would like to keep the stage open for questions. Uh, I have a question myself. So uh, if you could actually, I mean, do you want me to repeat the questions or do you want to answer them in the Q&A section one by one? Uh, yeah, well, why don't you repeat the questions? Uh, or, sure. You know, people to say they want. Okay. Um, uh, the first question is from Vijay Sharma. Uh, that would be me. And the question is, when are you coming to Hyderabad for the year? Yeah, uh, I, I, I'm guessing uh, after the pandemic. You know, I, I think if I, if I was going to, um, if I'm going to come, I think it's going to be for you know another, uh, you know, next year or the next or the year after that's uh, PyConf Hyderabad. I think the only uh, issue is when you got small children, sometimes it's a little hard to take these like 18 or 19 hour flights. Uh, and also when they're too, like I wanted to come last year, uh, but my son was too young to get any of the vaccines you need to go to India and it wasn't worth um, risking him getting dengue fever or whatever. Um, so, uh, you know, but as soon as, as soon as my kids are old enough to, to get the shots and, uh, and we, can, we can make a week out of it, uh, that's when I want to do it. I, you know, next year, two years from now, three years, but eventually it's definitely going to happen. Thank you for answering that question. So um, Sandeep Srivastava has a question. Can you please share examples of interfaces in daytime that had to be changed and based on what data feedback from the user did you had to? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that's a great question. And uh, you may have opened up a little bit of a, a Pandora's box there, Sandeep, because I have, I, have plenty of a, I have plenty of examples of this kind of thing. Um, you know, one issue is that uh, recently I introduced the Zone Info module uh, through PEP 615. And what that does is it's not actually deprecating anything because I, 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 the daytime module is, is pretty core. It, you know, it's, it's, it's almost on par with integers and floats where you really don't want to change the behavior of it. Um, but what I did introduce was the, uh, a new module for adding time zones to the standard library. And uh, so you should be able to just do, you know, Asia, Calcutta, uh, or Kolkata um, as uh, instead of you uh, instead of pulling in PyTZ or anything like that uh, but the thing is that PyTZ has a weird um, 
it has a weird interface, uh, which is one of the reasons why we didn't just kind of take PyTZ and put it into uh, into the standard library. And so um, uh, this had some consequences. One was that uh, I had to create the thing that I call PyTZ deprecation shim, which allows you to uh, we, to replace all your PyTZ time zones with something that doesn't depend on PyTZ and uses zone info under the under the hood, but it provides the same interface as PyTZ. But one thing about that is that um, I have another talk at this uh, about this that you can watch that I gave uh, at um, Chicago Python, and it's also in the PyTZ deprecation shim documentation. Uh, I think most of this stuff should be on my website uh, under talks. Um, and uh, the, the thing is that there's one problem, which is that daytime arithmetic is works a little differently than most people expect. And I would really actually like to deprecate that and um, change change it so that it's a lot more explicit what's going on. Uh, but the, the problem is that PyTZ, the way it works, uh, makes daytime arithmetic on aware daytimes work differently than it will uh, when you switch over to zone info. So that's been a challenge. And, uh, you know, I've tried to get the word out. Um, and, you know, it's not technically anything that anyone would be relying on because you have to make the active change from using PyTZ to zone info. But it, it is making the transition, of, you know, it, it is making people's transition away from PyTZ to zone info a little more painful, uh, which is something I regret. But I think at the end of the day, it will resolve um, cer certain um you know, foot guns and uh, and problems that people get themselves into. Mm, okay, so there seems to be another question here. Um, uh, feel yeah, free to ask. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. once again, someone has raised their hand and took it back. Don't be shy. Please raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah four or five minutes. Uh, we have. Yeah, we have. Two more minutes, though, but that's OK. We can extend this. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I can expand a little bit on the on the issue with the, the daytime arithmetic, which is that um, uh, right now, basically, the way it works is that if you have aware daytimes and naive daytimes, addition and subtraction work a little differently. And it's actually a fairly complicated set of, of properties that all interact with each other. And then they feed back into like hash equivalents and um, and and how they, the Dunder equal is implemented. Um, but the, the main issue is that when you take a time delta and you add um, and you add like one um, uh, and you and you add it to an aware date time, instead of you know, say say it spans over a, a daylight saving time transition, which doesn't really apply in, in India, but it will apply in the United States. Um, you may, you'll get something that is 24 nominal hours uh, later. So noon plus 24 hours will always be noon the next day, even if 25 hours have elapsed between those. Um, and you know, th this is a distinction that comes up with um, between. Uh, absolute daytime edition, right, which is total amount of time elapsed, versus calendar daytime edition, which is like, you know, on an idealized calendar. And I think, uh, depending on your use case, you may want one or the other. And I, I don't think it's even, you know, it might be an 80-20 split or something. I think people generally, it turns out, do want elapsed time, but we almost always use uh, uh, calendar time. Um, so that's a problem. And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that we may fix this by. Um, introducing just explicit methods that are like add absolute and add calendar and you know hopefully we won't have to actually deprecate uh, addition or um but you know we may have to deprecate and then re -add, uh, re add it uh oh, sandeep has another question which is that for excel daytime epoch mismatch does it have any impact on integration of Python daytime with Excel? And uh, the answer to that is no. I think these are totally unrelated things, um, as far as I can tell. I think uh, once Excel knows that something is a daytime, in when Python reads it, it will read it as a Python daytime, and we won't be affected by this this uh, this bug. That bug you would only really hit if you were looking at the raw integer that Excel stores it as. So basically, if you're implementing spreadsheets. And also, you know, I found that Sheets and LibreOffice Calc, they now default to using the Visual Basic system and not the Excel system. So I think this sort of thing, I mean, yes, this, this you, you do have the option of enabling this bug in 
in Google Sheets and also in LibreOffice Calc, uh, which is itself crazy. But at least now the default is something that doesn't have the bug. Uh, oh, and uh, Priya Brada has um, has a question about how to handle daylight saving time. Uh, for that, I think you should probably check out my website, Gansel.io. I have like many talks about this. Uh, the the one at Chicago Python uh, from this year is the most up to date, and I think gives a good insight into that. Uh, my blog also has uh, various uh, things about handling time zones. Um, and the Japanese time zone, as long as you're working with dates starting today and going forward, is a fixed offset, um, at least for now. Um, but Japanese time zone specifically is um, uh, it's generally easy. It's kind of like the Indian time zone, um, though that may change. I think they were contemplating the idea of uh, going on to some weird daylight saving time just during the Olympics in 2020. Uh, but now that that didn't happen, um, that became a bit of a non-issue. I think we're actually over time now, right? Yeah. And um, if you have any questions, folks, please, uh, uh, we have a lounge section. I think uh, Paul Gansel would be hanging around there, at least for a couple of minutes, to answer yeah, your I mean, questions. Midday is just starting. <laughs> yeah. It's 7.30 here. No. Man. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul, uh, for uh, uh, sharing your insights. Uh, and we will uh, close the session and the end of day one PyCon Hyderabad. Thanks all for joining in. Have a nice day. Have a good, nice, nice evening. Thank you.